Aristotelis to Leszczyk was interesting because he's a, a philosopher of history who started to create a science of civilizations as, as he termed it. Uh, even earlier than, than Spengler and Toynbee, uh, he lived uh, roughly, he was writing roughly in Speng Spengler's era, but started uh, uh, earlier. Um, and uh, Toynbee uh, wrote, who wrote a foreword uh, to his book on the plurality of civilizations, claimed that Konechny's work uh, should be studied uh, more uh, profoundly. So I, uh, the focus of this presentation is, uh, is on, uh, on something that uh, no other um, uh, philosopher of history uh, uh, tried to achieve, that is to say the the laws that the alleged uh, apparent laws that would govern the uh, life uh, of civilization. And one, one thing to note that Knesset is these days some, uh, somehow forgotten uh, for, for quite a few reasons because, first of all, communists believed he was anti Russian, um, because in uh, later works he mixed this pure academic insight with strong opinions about civilizations, which led to accusation of xenophobia. I can say that when I, when I look at his works, because I read most of them, or all of his works, he basically does not like, in terms of heart, um, hard, hard, cold-hearted feeling of support or whatever, he does not like any other civilization than the Latin or the Western. Uh, so, so that's why, that's why, uh, yeah, these accusations surface. And also, uh, some nationalists uh, hijack his heritage uh, in the post-communist era after 1989. So, just to give you this kind of snapshot of, of what what the story is about. So, he believed that we have uh, it's the map of Europe uh, in the 1920s, so in the interwar period. So uh, when it comes to Poland, that's this red, this yellow uh, area at the map, he believes that basically Europe is a Latin civilization, that is to say, a civilization based on uh, Roman heritage and, uh, uh, and Christian uh, faith. Uh, but he believed that uh, because his, his idea of civilization was civilizations were like more or less like Louis, so there was no, no, no territorial understanding of civilization. It was more like a, a network of ideas. So he believed in the uh, interwar period there was this, this Byzantine mood or Byzantine spirit. It's quite a Tongan idea that Toby was speaking about uh, civilizations invoking the spirit of different civilizations. So he believed the Latin civilization in Germany is invoking this Byzantine spirit that would really lead to, lead to another war which actually happened. So, in his, in his kind of understanding, Poland had this Byzantine spirit uh, rising uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the West, and then Turanian civilization, Russian civilization, uh, in, the, uh, in the East. And Turan was this uh, step that goes through the horizontally through a large portion of Russia. That's, that's why he, he kind of termed the civilization uh, Turanian. So, 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 and this actually led to uh, to abuse his works. For example, there was this uh, in the nineties already. There was a, a Russian lobby that was saying, "Look, Poland should leave the United, uh, leave the, the European Union because Germany is destroying the, the Western civilization." On the other hand, nationalists were uh, were using uh, uh, connection as basically to, to uh, sow discord between Poland and different countries by just claiming uh, 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 he, he is speaking about you know, different civilizations as well. So that's, that's the important thing. But when it comes to the very theory, it's extremely inspiring. He believed a civilization is the method of collective life. So uh, he tried to, tried to create uh, something uh, he called a, quin a quincunx or or a pentagon, or whatever you call it. Basically, uh, the, the network of five concepts, good, truth, prosperity, health, and beauty, and uh, various connections between them. And for him, the, every civilization has this kind of unique 
uh, in relation to quintus, uh, it defines these concepts differently. So two of them, good and true, uh, good and true are uh, immaterial. Uh, have prosperity and health is material can be measured, and beauty is somewhere in between. And just to make the story short, he believed there are seven civilizations in the world today. Latin, or more or less Western, Turanian, uh, more or less Russian, the Judaic, uh, Byzantine, Arab, more or less Islamic, Brahmanical, and uh, Chinese. And an important thing in his approach is this fluid fluidity I mentioned. So, many civilizations can mix on a certain territory. Um, there is no territorial aspect of, uh, of, of civilization. It's more, it's more, it's more about these quincunxes that kind of interact uh, with uh, one another. Uh, and every civilization has this specific single philosophical system uh, uh, as, a, as a basis, and they are kind of serve, they are serving as roots of civilizations. And this, and the, exactly uh, the, the, the very idea I think uh, I mentioned is, is really worth reading today is this uh, the last part of the of the presentation uh, right now, the laws of history. So he believes. The civilizations uh, are governed by a certain set of laws. Um, he tried to discover them, he never, he never claimed he finally discovered them, but these were the laws of commensurability, the laws of no synthesis, impossible mixtures, the advantage of inferiority, uh, the, the law of inequality and of expansion. I will just briefly mention uh, or just elaborate these, uh, uh, these laws and I will try to assess or well, let's start to uh, assess them preliminary uh, to give this kind of preliminary assessment of uh, this idea. So, uh, first two laws. Uh, you can encapsulate them by saying you can't be civilized in two ways. So, there's this law of commensurability, commensurability and the law of non synthesis. So, in a way, one person, as you, uh, you or me, can draw from only one pentagon, one quincunx. Uh, of civilizational ideas, and in the long run, can every one of us can mentally belong to only one civilization. Uh, so civilizations are incommensurable, incommensurable with each other, which means uh, they do not network. I mean, you cannot uh, have identity that takes some uh, ideas from one civilization from the other, because at some point you will experience the contradiction. And he also believed that the assimilation can only take place within cultures of one civilization, which means uh, uh, if you have two civilizations in your soul, uh, finally uh, you will have this contradiction. So Islam will not assimilate with Christianity, Christianity will not uh, assimilate with, for example, Confucian values and so on. Uh, so this is probably uh, wrong uh, when we look at uh, from the perspective of, of, of current knowledge. Because well, we know these ideas, the ideas of civilizations we have in our hearts can hold. Uh, we can look at the evolution of Jewish ethics, Chinese uh, ethics, Catholic ethics. They, all, they can overlap in places, and they can become more, or less, uh, more similar, less similar, and so on. And also, when you look at this, the, the, the current uh, cross-cultural psychology uh, as, a, as, a, as a field of research, sorry, there's a, there's a mistake. Uh, a, a general thesis these days is that you can uh, safely put into your heart two cultural identities and then uh, commit some work to uh, uh, harmonize them. So it will basically, well, uh, say his law that does not work because you can have two cultural identities and become coherent with these identities somehow. Uh, there's another law, uh, the law of impossible mixtures. Mixtures of two civilizations end up tragically for the weaker civilization. Uh, so as there are no synthesis of entire civilizations, they are sometimes you can mix. You know, parts of this pentagon, parts of this quintus with uh, with one another. Uh, so, what we, when we think of trading networks, mixed marriages, and basically societal uh, interaction, the axiologists can mix, but over time, 
uh, he believed uh, uh, if this kind of mixture of different civilizations take place, there will be this vicious circle that will lead to segregation, alienation, lack of solidarity. So we could say that instead of this target homogeneous mix, that the mixture, the homogeneous mixture um, uh, of two civilizations mixing, you always end up, according to Konechne, with the contradictory and heterogeneous uh, mixture. And to show you this, uh, like more, uh, just more visually. So you, you imagine you have like on, on a certain territory, you have one civilization, then the other civil, the, the, the other civilization is pouring in. Uh, so uh, normally, if you shake the you know the liquid in a in a glass. Uh, you would expect this heterogeneous, harmonic, you know, um, societal, civilizational uh, existence, coexistence. Um, uh, um, sorry, homogeneous. You would expect the homogeneous, you know, harmonic uh, coexistence. But for Konechny, in long run, uh, the mixture will, will always kind of become heterogeneous. It will, uh, there will be, it will never, the, the, the two quintessences will not mix uh, seamlessly. There will, there, will always be a, there will always be a kind of uh, uh, tension. Uh, thus, uh, uh, managing these two civilizations in a certain, on a certain territory would be different. And this is, well, when you look at how, how, how we approach the intercultural research, it's, it's, it's rather not true, but also, in some aspects, partially true. Right? Because, Interactive, uh, interactive civilizations may seek common grounds. Uh, contemporary dialogue uh, about non-violence uh, between Western and Islamic civilizations. And there's also this idea by uh, one of the IACSC directors, Vito uh, Taskapolis, uh, that by referring to, uh, by reference to common universal uh, criteria, like ideas, Two different civilizations can uh, harmonize and create a coherent, um, coherent entity. Uh, yeah, but in, in a way, convention is right that the mixtures are often tragic. So instead of this harmony between civilizations, you can have a clash. And well, where, whenever, wherever you have a, a large cultural distance between two interacting cultures. Then you also have segregation and, uh, and, and, and tension. So, uh, so we could also think even further. There is this uh, uh, Chinese thinker, Wu Fengming, uh, who, um, who, is, who was the precursor, who was just, just the proponent of the idea of the civilizational fusion, and he thought uh, Confucianism could uh, be, be useful for the West uh, to uh, by partially change its ways. Or, uh, I did not define the extent, but this kind of idea of civilizational future is here currently. Uh, let's look at the examples. At Ukraine, uh, it's not an example of, the, of, 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 a, of a civilizational fusion. It's rather an example of um, a country that wants to switch its civilizational identity uh, to, to, to move in conventional uh, words from Turanian to uh, Latin uh, civilization. Then you have Israel. Uh, so uh, we could think of Israel as um, well of the nation of, of the nation within the West. We could think of, of um, uh, Israel as separate civilization but westernized. Or we could think of uh, modern Israel as a fusion of Western and uh, 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 Jewish civilizations. But when we look, for example, at the, the case of Hong Kong before uh, Chinese takeover and current Japan, then we could really uh, go closer to the idea of uh, fusion of East and West. Some scholars claim that uh, Hong Kong before uh, the Chinese takeover was this kind of uh, typical uh, modern idea of the fusion of the West and the Confucian civilizations. The same idea with Japan. There's the big discussion uh, whether they formed, already formed a different civilizational identity. This is pro uh, probably uh, Lake Huntington. He was supporting this thesis uh, because uh, when first Huntington uh, uh, 
put Japan into Confucian circle. Then there was this uh, great debate, and then he switched to treating uh, uh, Japan as separate uh, civilization. Another example is the um, U.S. role in Afghanistan. In my assessment, I've written more about this in the which I can I I I share some essays. They try to uh, perform a nation building, but without civilizational building. So those uh, the fusion was not uh, that successful as it could be. Another law: uh, less developed civilization, not accepting mixtures, will triumph over more developed civilization, but mixed. Well, there's no data, absolutely no data to. Uh, to, to, to assess this law, because uh, Kunesha did not give the criteria uh, how to distinguish between more or less developed civilizations, so it's hard to, uh, hard to assess that. Another uh, civilizational law, inequality is natural uh, and encourages, de encourages development and progress. He called it a law of inequality. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not that bad as it sounds. It's, he's not saying inequality is super cool. It's, he's just saying the uh, complexity of civilization and inequality are a priori, they are irremovable from, from, from uh, civilization, and they provide the basis for development. So, for example, the higher the level, the level of development of civilization, the greater the social, as he called, differentiation. And complete removal of inequality is impossible, and it would eliminate the, the, the dynamics, the flow of civilization. So he was not praising uh, inequality, he was just saying inequality is a constant stimulus uh, to act. It's, it's, it's almost like Toynbian uh, challenge and response uh, thesis. So it's, this, this law seems to be the truth. Research on sustainable development confirms uh, complexity, hierarchy, inequality increase with development of civilization. And there are different types of inequalities within uh, civilizations. Uh, the last law, uh, the, the law of expansion. This is a very interesting law. Uh, civilizations need, need expansion to last. Uh, Civilizations do not age, but last as long as they are capable of expansion. But, but one important thing, he did not say about, uh, not, not, he wasn't saying mainly about uh, territorial expansions. He was also uh, treating uh, expansion as a movement towards um, inside, a movement within. So uh, just as Tony claimed uh, um, a, a mature civilization generates challenge, challenges for itself and then, then, then uh, um, uh, resolves them. This is what Konechna also said, that uh, um, the, 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 the mature civilization expands towards itself and frequently the responsibility for this expansion is uh, on the shoulders of those of, of, on the, the edge, or the, the entities in the states that uh, are in the boundary region. This is probably explaining uh, why uh, there's so many uh, civilization researchers these days in, uh, uh, and, you know, in Eastern Europe, in uh, Croatia, in, in, in Israel, in this, these boundary regions. Uh, and, and he had this very, very complexity theory-like uh, thesis that the higher um, uh, the, the civilization, the higher the cost of maintaining it. So it is true. Uh, of course, there is a mistake in the mechanics studying from previous laws. Uh, but uh, this very idea is, uh, I just, I just, I just recall, he was writing in the 1920s, and he had this really uh, good complexity theory-related uh, uh, intuitions. So, uh, according to Konechny, civilizations compete with each other whenever they meet, uh, as there is no common pool because they are constantly taking uh, the resources of each other. Um, and when there is no expansion, the civilization basically withers, uh, this a-civilizational state. So, of course, I have this objection to, 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 to this idea. Uh, uh, because there, there might exist a common pool if you look at the research uh, that led to the emergence of uh, human development index. You have, you have a common civilizational pool that belongs to that global civilization and not to a specified uh, civilization. Uh, 
But so in general, so, so in general, uh, Konechny in his work did not um, treat, uh, did not think of this the most general level, the greater civilization identity of of what we think, of what we um, uh, have in mind when we speak about that civilization, because we have that civilization as a global civilization, and then civilizational identities that divide the world into different uh, civilizations. So, summing up, did his law stand the test of time? And just look at uh, uh, just yeah, some adding up. Uh, so, two of the, his theses were wrong. Uh, one, of the, one of them was partially true, one of, one of the two were true, and uh, when it comes to one of them, we, we have no data. So, we can say half of this law has stood the test of time. Uh, if we would take uh, some th his theory uh, 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 to make it more fitting into the common, uh, the, the modern uh, uh, civilizational challenges, you would have to really reformulate. And this is what we hope for, because this, this is a beautiful quote written in, uh, in, in, the 19, in the 1920s. The present work is intended to be a roof over the construction of my science of civilization. A completion of what I have managed to do myself, of what I have been able to afford in my current conditions. I started out the initiative in hope of obtaining successes who would wish to correct me because my work meanders amid deficiencies. So he was aware of that he is just erring. Um, and every generation should uh, attempt a uh, synthesis. And now the big data sets in. In the era of big data, this is my. This is what I realized when, 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 when writing my PhD on Joseph Taylor. Um, philosophy of history or civilization theory is really developing on many, in many different fields, such a very diverse field, such as intercultural research from psychology, predictive geopolitical algorithms, so the tools that serve uh, in, in uh, international relations theories to predict the conflicts, uh, agent based modeling that is to say digital humanities. So this research is conducted uh, today uh, not under the label of civilization theory, but it's still awaiting a new uh, synthesis. And when I think of big data, I mean basically two things. First, the, the very ocean of data that we have through, uh, through the digitalization. And the algorithm, that, the algorithms, that is to say, uh, the, the tools to analyze order reality. This is what, for example, um, uh, American scholar Peter Turchin is doing with, with his idea of SESHA database. So this database serves to kind of order facts about uh, uh, history and development of civilization and to, to algorithmically uh, find uh, some regularities. And just to finish this with this uh, positive note, there's a need of understanding and, uh, well, civilizations matter, we can say. Uh, when you look at the phrase civilization identity uh, uh, in, uh, in literature published in English, we could see really a skyrocketing. The, this very concept is skyrocketing, of course, due to globalization and uh, uh, modern, uh, modern uh, civilizational networking. And we could face something what uh, Christian Kumar, uh, American scholar, uh, calls a return, the return of civilization. So basically, uh, people still want to, to try to reconnect or re restart, relaunch the, the research on civilization. For example, uh, now let's go to politics. Trump used the word civilization ten times during his speech in Warsaw. But of course, uh, people started to think what he actually means, that what, what, what he means by a civilization, and there was no clear answer. And here emerges the problem uh, that we would all have to uh, basically focus on. Uh, many would like to use the term uh, to understand the world again, but we are afraid that there, our theories might, might be weaponized and discriminate someone and uh, uh, create some commotion or be weaponized by politicians. So when we look at the works uh, uh, of authors such as Peter Katzenstein, Joseph Painter, Ian Morris, Francis Fukuyama, and the others, they have not transcended, they have not resolved this uh, aporia, uh, whereas 
there is a way to, 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 to resolve this problem. So, first of all, um, we have to assume that civilizations matter. This is what the ICST is doing, and this is a great thing. Because civilizations or cultural zones uh, do exist and do evolve. Uh, this is uh, the evolution of cultural identities in accordance to uh, the World Values Survey. Uh, the, the researcher tries to measure cultural traits and features across the globe and then comparatively set, put them on this kind of map, I would say cultural or civilizational map. And uh, this is also uh, this idea that relating to what Nelson was saying about commensurability. So he might have meant, we don't know, but he probably meant that the areas of low cultural distance are better integrated with each other, which basically what is confirmed by uh, modern uh, intercultural psychology that says the greater cultural distance, the greater work is needed to harmonize uh, for example, a migrant's identity that becomes dual or threefold or, or, or fourfold. So, um, and then this is, sorry, I just, I, I, I wasn't uh, intending to put myself there, it's, but it's, uh, it's the, it's, I didn't, I just didn't, I just didn't find uh, the, uh, the picture that's good enough, I didn't have access to my computer when I was this presentation. But this is uh, basically my ongoing work about uh, uh, creating the kind of uh, new civilizational uh, map, uh, liquid, uh, called liquid civilization. So, for example, the blue, the blue field. Um, how, how, how is it? Made? I'll tell you just you know. So, uh, the colors, of course, are different civilizations. The, the, the size of the the size of the, the circles uh, are related to the power of a given entity. Uh, I'm an author of something that is called State Power Index that measures uh, globally in the global in the, globally uh, the power of, of nations. And of course, uh, there are two axes. There, are one one of the axes is about the. Um, Cultural, cultural uh, traits related mostly to world value serving, but also to different uh, sources that are uh, first global and comparable. And, uh, and another accent is related to uh, freedoms or liberties. Uh, I we use different different uh, and harmonize we use and harmonize different indices related to. Um, uh, the, yeah, national freedom and so on. And we could see, you know, for example, that the West, you know, remain, uh, the, 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 the blue thing, remains uh, a kind of uh, coherent, right, I, uh, identity. The, 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 the states of the West are close to each other. But we also, we can also note in interesting things, for example, the Confucian civilization that is yellow, is split between the, well, maybe westernized or uh, maybe more individualized uh, Confucian cultures and uh, more uh, collectivist cultures. And when we look at the current network of alliances these days in terms of geopolitics, so we could say Taiwan, South Korea and Japan are in at least in certain economic cultural dimensions close to, uh, close to the West. Of course, these balls would, would be moving, you know, annually if we would be, uh, if we could measure it. That and World Value Survey is doing this periodically. Uh, different uh, different indices are not uh, that frequently actualized, so so we we might have this kind of econometric problem. But it also shows that uh, civilization is an evolving organism. And it's it's uh, it has its own uh, gravitational field. The, that um, facilitates uh, the civilizational interaction, and that basically these these connections, uh, ideas about the quincunx, or basically the essence, or political cultural um, set of uh, network of concept that generate this the soul, or however you call it. So it could be measured, and that's basically my idea. Um, uh, uh, Finish. One minute. Yes, yes, yes. I'm almost yes. I trade it, you know, I just one minute left and I just, just finished it. 
Uh, so the academia has this opportunity to start research on uh, the laws of history. It sounds grandiose, laws of history, but these are civilizational laws, if we could rephrase it. Uh, however, it must deal with this paradox that civilization theory is frequently weaponized, and it might do so through creating concepts that complement qualitative uh, talking with quantitative uh, analysis and research. Because it's empirically verifiable and you can always question the uh, you know, empirical methodology and not necessarily uh, the ideological uh, grounding. Uh, of course, we also have to use big data, empirical tools to verify civilization related thesis. Then we can generate conclusions. And we can't be afraid of modeling civilizational processes with digital and AI related tools, because they also can give a really novel insight. Uh, and I think this is, the, this is the, the greatest challenge for the future. Uh, to uh, well to reuse the, the heritage that we have, including connection, uh, but in this way that would that could not be uh, weaponized. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions.